From Chicago's Can TV, a look at the week's events is reported in the newspapers, in the blogs and online, and on radio and TV. This is Chicago Newsroom. Well, hi there. Welcome back to the show. It's Chicago Newsroom on Can TV. I'm Ken Davis. And if you enjoy politics, and you probably do if you spend any time watching this show, this Illinois thing is really getting interesting now. The control has just made the obligatory announcement, you know, the one they always have to make right before, right on cue, that paychecks will stop on July 15th and school funding is going to stop on August the 10th. But of course, the legislators, if they would only just give the governor that so-called business reform he wants, it wouldn't be necessary to subject the good people of Illinois to all this agony, right? You know, for years, there's been this image that floated around Illinois of the imponderable Mike Madigan, right around noon, breaking out his special knife and his one apple. And it's said that he carefully peels the apple and in his own taciturn, sly way, he devours one slice after another. And that's said to engender ice cold fear in his political adversaries. I'm wondering how Bruce Rauner felt the first time he walked into a room and saw that. Did he turn to the guy he brings with him to every meeting to peel the skin off his grapes and say, oh, can you believe how pompous this jerk is? Well, anyway, it's a day. The reverent Chicago Newsroom will prevent, present to you two great reporters to whom you owe a great deal of debtitude because they've been spending their time following all this nonsense so you and I don't have to click on the radio. All we got to do is just click on the radio and pick up the paper and we can get the latest on this weird, strangely predictable melodrama. And uh, with that overwrought entrance, I, uh, I welcome you both to the show. Kim Geiger, Chicago Tribune, first time here, and I'm really happy to have you here. Thanks for having and me. our old buddy Tony Arnold back at the table one more time. Okay. Hey, so um, there, there is, of course, this piece of breaking news that, that broke yesterday with the uh, um, Leslie Munger, the, uh, the, what is she? She's the controller, right? Controller, yeah. Controller. Uh, saying that uh, we are in, we are in it deep now. We're gonna, we're gonna, the checks are gonna stop coming. Well, she was, she was laying out sort of the deadlines that are coming up because mm -hmm. it's, it's not like if there's no spending plan approved by Rauner and the Democratic leaders, then the cash stops cold. Yep. There's, there's certain deadlines. So she's laying out sort of the what's coming up. Mm -hmm. uh, July 1 is the immediate deadline, she said, for things like Medicaid payments. Um, and uh, soon after that for paychecks for state employees. And she's important because she's the one, it's her name on the checks. Right. She's the one who's actually signing these checks that totals more than $30 billion. Mm -hmm. uh, that's numbers being in yeah. dispute right now. But uh, so she's kind of caught in the middle of this whole thing. Um, and then, the, as you said, that you know, in August there's going to be this whole issue of, of whether schools get money, and if they don't, how long, how much do they have in reserves to actually stay open? So CPS? Are you kidding? You know, <laughs> CPS, yeah, Chicago Public Schools is another yeah. issue. But it, what I thought was interesting was that um, she's caught in the middle of this whole Matt Rauner versus Mike Madigan and John Cullerton thing, and um, she clearly chose sides um, to the person that appointed her. Well, to the, yeah, he well, appointed you might her, expect yeah. it, but yeah. at the same time. Yeah. Um, you know, I, there's a part of me that does wonder what Judy Bartopinka would have done in right, this job. Right, she would have caused right. more of a ruckus with this or mm -hmm. whatever. Regardless, um, you know, Leslie Munger is the comptroller, and, and she's saying that she sides with, with Bruce Rauner that we need. Right. What she said uh, is reforms before revenues. Um, she talked about structural reforms. Some of these key phrases she was saying were straight out of out of what you hear Bruce Rauner say yeah, five times yeah. a day. I, I copied down from Kim, Kim's story the quote, I am supporting that we need reforms as part of our government to get the budget. That's what our controller said. So, And, and it is interesting. I mean, I, I think you're right. There is a kind of a side note here that normally we think of controllers as being these kind of um, you know, they're essentially functionaries. They're elected functionaries. Their job is just to take the money and write the checks with it. But we now have a much more political controller who is a clear ally and an appointee in this case of the, of the governor. So he's, um, she's, she's on his side. We, we can't expect anything less, right? She wouldn't, yeah, she, would, she was asked a lot about her connections to Rauner and, and just sort of how much do you believe mm -hmm. needs, of his plan needs yeah. to get passed before you're willing to sign the checks uh -huh. to go out, and and she wouldn't specify which ones, but she was very clear that that the governor's laid out his priorities, uh -huh. and those are the ones. That and those are mine. The, well, she didn't yeah. quite say it that clearly, <laughs> but, but that was the assumption. 
So um, you, you actually had a, an interesting day yesterday. You were standing in the sweltering heat in Decatur mm -hmm. uh, watching the governor do the thing that he seems to do best, which is campaign, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, that's been an interesting um, theme sort of over the past few months is that the governor has, he, he came out in February, he laid out his agenda, he said this is what I want. Um, initially it was like this really long list with all of these bullet points, dozens and dozens of bullet mm -hmm. points. And then he hit the road and went and tried to sell this plan to local voters around the state. He was out on the road for a few months. Um, he kind of stopped that in May when the legislature started moving pieces of his agenda and kind of knocking down pieces one by one and mm -hmm. pushing their own budget forward. And now that we've passed the May 31st deadline, he's back on the road and he's pushing the agenda again. And this time he's much more forcefully kind of going after Mike Madigan and John Cullerton yeah. and kind of trying to lay the blame for the, this budget problem on the two of them. And the, and the Chicago machine. And the Chicago and machine, and actually he kind of tied the two of them to Rob Bogoyevich yesterday, <laughs> which was, he, has, he doesn't typically do that, but yeah, yeah so he's, he's sort of ratcheting yeah. it up, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, is it, is it fair to observe that a governor, at least the, the, the model of a governor, which we've come to expect, not just in Illinois, but anywhere, would not be a guy who'd be out running around talking to the real folks out in the main street uh, at a time like this. He'd be, he'd be in the rooms of the Capitol cutting deals and you know, wrenching arms and, and being forceful about being a governor. I, 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 I have to say, I don't mean this to be overly critical, I just can't understand why he's not there driving home his bargain. Well, here's the thing. He he's he narrowed down all of his bullet points to like five things, and the five things happen to be things that really target key Democratic power bases, right? Uh, organized labor, trial lawyers, um, the ability of Democrats to hold hold power by drawing maps mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. with term limits, right? He's going after guys who've been there for decades yeah. and saying, I want term yeah. limits. So the things that he's chosen to focus on, it's a pretty big package of things that point directly at. Democrats' power, mm -hmm. um, and as Tony mentioned, the, the the timeline for solving this this impasse is really we've got a few weeks, months potentially to go. Um, just because the fiscal year turns on July first doesn't mean that things actually really start to get bad. So, yeah. right now, this is what he's doing. But I I guess, I guess I still don't quite understand the. I mean, I don't know who his advisors are and what kind of advice they're giving him, but it seems to me a little bit odd that you're coming in, as you said, with this, this bulletproof majority in both houses, and you're saying, <clears throat> before we do a budget, guys, I just want you to repudiate everything you believe in and give me that, and then we can talk about a budget. I mean, okay, if you're an ideologue who was you know, who came to office just with that sort of ideology, I suppose you can do that. But if you, if you're a, we're, we're told constantly, this is a brilliant businessman who knows how to negotiate, who knows how to get the deal made. This doesn't look like a guy who has any idea how to make a deal happen. Of course, I could be proven wrong in the next week or two, but right now it looks weird. Well, that's assuming that, that there is going to be any sort of deal <laughs> done. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, <laughs> it's, uh, I think what you're seeing strategically is he's not calling, uh, he mentions term limits, but that's never been even brought up for, he, he has these ideas, like as Kim was saying, that, that are Democratic ideas, right. and the Democrats are not going to let those pass. Yeah. So how is Rauner going to, or any of his allies in the legislature, going to actually bring these for a vote and a discussion that are, that are his side of things? And so you're seeing this, the Democrats are, are proposing Rauner's ideas in their own form of bills, picking apart something like a property tax freeze and all the little concepts that go along with a property tax freeze or, or the compensation that workers get who are, who are injured on the job, uh, picking apart every little thing that goes along with that, then putting it up for a vote. Um, and, then, and then this is what we've seen the exercise be for the last mm -hmm. month now, um, at least. And so, you know, that, the fact that, that Rauner's pushing this, it's not like the, the way that he's doing it is a campaign style because it's not like he can go to the legislature and get the votes to pass these things. So what else are you going to do but try to convince people, I guess, um, to, to try to go to your side? Um, hmm. I think what's interesting is that 
he's going around and, and talk, comparing, you know, bringing up Blagojevich in the context of Madigan and Cullerton in the past. And you've even heard Speaker Madigan bring up Blagojevich in the context of how Rauner's acting mm -hmm. um, on, I think, WGN radio. So it's like, so publicly they're, they're, they're bringing up some of the most sensitive things you can bring up against another politician, against yeah, the, your, yeah. the opposite side on the yeah. table. Privately, I, I guess it's interest, I, I'd be interested to see how, how well they're getting along to, to actually avoiding any kind of shutdown or lockout or anything else that we're well, talking that, about. Well, that's the big question, isn't it? I'm sure you guys don't get that, <laughs> that level of access <laughs> to be able to assess that. But, I mean, this is, this is one of the things that has just been so overwhelmingly interesting about this, about this election season and, and the resulting f last few months. Because a lot of us were saying, you know, this Madigan guy and this Rauner guy, they're basically the same guy. And you throw in Rahm Emanuel and all three of them. I mean, they're just, they're just and, and Cullerton, all four of them. They're all the same guy. So they're going to sit down in a room. They're going to slice this thing up and they're going to come up with a deal. It doesn't look right now like that's what's happening. But, of course, we don't really know. Maybe this is all just theater. Well, I think it's important to remember that the, so the governor is a Republican. He's dealing with a Democratic majority in the legislature. And the General Assembly, their core purpose is to pass a budget, right? Mm -hmm. So um, it makes sense that he's attaching all of these things. Like Mike Madigan is saying, you know, he's operating from the extreme and um, by putting all of these non-budget issues, attaching them to the budget. But really, the budget is where he has leverage. Mm -hmm. Once they get a budget deal, what's Good he going to do? Go to yeah. the Democrats and be like, now I would like all of these other things. <laughs> I, <laughs> that's okay. not going to happen. Yeah. So it, it makes sense to me that he's attaching the things. It's just a question really of like, who calls uncle first, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think what I'd add to that too is, you know, he's he's going around. I mean, how is he? If he's characterizing Madigan and Cullerton as getting rich off of the government, which he has done, and saying that that they're conflicted, and he's campaign saying that that unions are conflicted because um, they support politically the people who support them, and so he's going. He has to make deals with the people that he's saying are conflicted. And there has, is that, and, and so. Yeah. How, I, yeah. I'm a little, you know, he might be boxing himself in a corner a little yeah, bit in yeah, that yeah. whether you like it or not, people still voted majority, yeah. super majority of Democrats in both chambers. And, and here's right. another thing, too. I mean, Bruce Rauner won. He won handily. I mean, it wasn't an overwhelming election, but he, he won solidly. And he won by saying, elect me and I'll fix Illinois. All right, just elect me, I'll fix Illinois. Well, at some point, those people who crossed over from Pat Quinn thinking, I would like to have Illinois repaired, it's certainly in bad repair, are going to look at this guy and say, huh, you were the guy that we, you, we called you in to fix it? I mean, it, it, at some point, there's going to be a kind of a, of a rebellion against him, I would think, if he doesn't start to show that he has the ability to govern. Yeah. He also said he was going to shake up Springfield. Oh, he said that too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, I so forgot that. So he's part. doing that. Right. He's um, shaking up Springfield. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, there's that. Yeah. I, I think what I'm curious is I've been trying to play this out in my head, and let's say it's the end of August, and there's still no budget deal, and now schools and the schools can't open their doors, and, mm -hmm. and now it's you're seeing this right here in front mm -hmm. of your face. It's it's it's. In, in you know the the consequences are real, and now you don't know what to do with, mm -hmm. with your kids during the day, and and you're you're trying, you're angry, and you're frustrated. And you do, are you going to direct your your focus to the governor, who's saying, you know what, we got we got to freeze property taxes. This is mm -hmm. this is one of the biggest things that we mm -hmm. got wrong. Mm -hmm. Is that what you're going to put in your in your mind there, as you as you can't take your kid to school or whatever? Right, right. Um, it, I think that that the governor's picked a, a few issues to harp on term limits. Um, redistricting and, and property taxes that mm -hmm. are really, um, you know, they can be sold, I, I guess, as, as populist. I mean, I'm thinking yeah. of the mes messaging of this. Yeah, yeah. Um, but then if, if you get into the nuance of this, which is what the Democrats are trying to do, is like, well, you want to keep your school doors open, yeah. you've got to talk about property taxes. Yeah. I mean, this is something that that they're, they're tied together. This is how schools get funded in this state. So, I, And I just can't help... Um, I, I just can't help but get this feeling, and again, I, the, the, I, it's, it's hard to base it on anything, but this feeling that his people are a little bit out of their leagues. I think, I think he has people working for him who might not be 
many of them veterans of this kind of thing before. And they're just kind of, they're a little bit shell-shocked at how hard this has turned out to be. It's hard, this job. Right. And, and if you go in, if you go in to be governor, you, it's true for every governor, right away you've got a budget that you've got to do. And that budget is the thing that defines you. And it would seem to me that the way to do that would be to bring in the best and the brightest people you can think of and come up with a document that accomplishes through that document the objectives that you want. You want to you screw the unions? Well, then let's come up with a budget that frankly screws the unions and put that in the hopper and make them vote on it. Right. But instead of that, he kind of bad choice of terms, but kind of ran away for a hundred days. He wasn't around. At least that's what they say. And so this, I mean, we've glossed over this, but this is one of the most amusing things I've seen in, in decades in Illinois, where this guy comes in with all these ideas. I want to, you know, I want uh, worker compensation reform. I want a property tax freeze. I want redistricting. But he doesn't put anything in the hopper to get that. He doesn't he doesn't shape his budget to reflect that. And so then Mike Madigan, who has a little bit, I understand he's experienced at this stuff, I don't know. He just goes and writes a shell bill for what he thinks the governor might submit. And then, of course, they vote it down. I mean, it's brilliant. It's just absolutely brilliant, even though many of us who don't particularly like Mike Madigan would find that to be a, a repulsive thing to do. It was pretty damn clever political theater. So I, I put the question to you, and I know it's, it's difficult, and you're reporters, you can't really answer this question, but is there, <laughs> is there a possibility that this guy is a little bit outclassed at this point, that he's, that he's finding it a little hard to get traction? I'd take issue with the, how you're characterizing a little bit, because Rauner did, I mean, he, one of the first things that I noticed that he was surrounding himself with when he, when he first took office was he came in saying, I'm going to shake up Springfield. Mm -hmm. He hired quite a few people who had actually been around Springfield a very long time. Okay. Uh, as chief of staff, his budget director, um, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. He's also contracted with people not from Illinois at all. Um, there's, there's one of the budget hawks that he's hired has gone from several states um, right. talking about how to how to make cuts in a way that, that balances your budget. So it's, it's, he has done this combination of, of people who have been around um, mostly the Republican Party in Springfield for, for several years. Mm -hmm. um, that said, you know, as far as how Rauner looks versus the Madigan and Cullerton, how that, those two jive, I mean, like, Madigan uh, survived a campaign a few years ago that was called Fire Madigan. I mean, it was from the yeah, Republicans. Right. They, they went to right. um, the conventions uh, in the 2012 saying, Fire Madigan, you can buy a t-shirt, a mug, a, a dog jacket. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, mm -hmm. they really pushed yeah, Fire yeah, Madigan, yeah. and then they ended up with a super, Democrats won a super majority in the House after mm -hmm. that campaign. Mm -hmm. It really did nothing. And I think, you know, that's kind of the, the A, the, it builds to the mystique of, of Michael Madigan and this power that he has, but then two, it's just how the speaker can can pick up districts along the way and still retain the speakership along the mm -hmm. way. It's it's mm -hmm. if you really wanted to do an organized way of, of taking him down, you're going to see what what Rauner's starting to do, which is target very specific Democratic representatives, and people are going to have to get more used to who their state representative is in next year's campaign. Mm -hmm. um, it's just that very it's, good a, it's, point. it's a year away, yeah, but yeah. but I think people are going to be hearing more about who their state representative is in an effort to try for Republicans to try to take down Michael And Madigan. there is money. There is money like there's never been before for that exact same kind of targeting, right? And he's serious about it. He's going to do it. Well, he hasn't done it yet, but mm -hmm. the threat of it is out there. And yeah. sometimes yeah. that's actually even more powerful than the money itself, mm -hmm. just the mm -hmm. having it looming yeah. there over yeah. this guy's yeah. head. I do want to bring in uh, our distinguished mayor because um, I, I, I give him a lot of credit for uh, being a, kind of a very shrewd politician. We've seen him in the back uh, in, in the years when he was in the House and everything. He's clearly a guy who understands how to play politics. And I'm fascinated by the fact that he has decided to just take himself into the back room and close the door. He's, he's not part of this at all. He doesn't want to be a part of this, at least not publicly. So the questions are, A, is he working behind the scenes to do something? And B, if not, what's going on with him? Where's the mayor? I don't think it's that behind the scenes. Um, he 
passed a pension bill that relies on money from a casino that doesn't mm -hmm. exist or hasn't even been approved. <laughs> well, yeah. That's just, I mean, it's very obvious where his priorities are. Uh, and well so, put, yeah. Uh, yeah, and yeah. so. He I, got that. He, yeah. Well, he got the pension bill. He, he didn't get, get the casino. He got well, but he got he, the thing he wanted, right. which was the relief from having to pay that, that bill this year. Right, right. And hopefully we'll get a casino at some point. Right, but he only got it passed, and that's the thing. Now this bill is part of this mess between um, Rauner and the Democrats mm -hmm. in the General Assembly, right? Mm -hmm. Rauner's not necessarily signing that bill. Mm -hmm. And the Democrats haven't sent it to Rauner to sign yeah. because that's, I think that's where the behind the scenes stuff comes because um, Emmanuel is probably still negotiating somewhat to some extent with, with Coach and Madigan and, and Rauner to see, to make sure that the pension bill that he passed that puts off this right. gigantic almost $600 million payment this year off for, for five years. So, I, you know, whether there's some grand deal or whether Emmanuel is able to just kind of pick this one bill off and let Rauner yeah. Um, yeah. grant that, I don't know. But also you've heard Rauner go around talking about how the Chicago machine is ruining the city, has mm -hmm. ruined the city's finances. He's he's talking about the unions as part of that also, the Chicago Teachers Union. Yeah, yeah. So um, it's you're, you're seeing the state the statewide fight play out also in a similar way in, in the city of Chicago. There was something I wanted to ask you guys. Um, see if I got this right. The, the Democrats passed a budget. They've done their job. They've passed a budget. It's only $3 billion out of balance, however, so it probably won't pass muster. But didn't the governor put forward his own budget, and wasn't it also out of budget? Do I remember that correctly? Yeah, so the budget that he put forward um, included $2.2 .2 billion in savings from this pension plan that he wanted um, to create. He wanted to shift. So that's his casino, basically. It's the same kind of kind, thing. Kind right? of, <laughs> yeah. And from the minute that, that that proposal dropped, people were like, that's yeah. never going to happen. So yeah. you're $2, two billion short. Mm -hmm. but, um, but, you know, it was just a proposal. And at this point, um, I think that... Um, that proposal has That's been set <laughs> Well, see, the reason I ask this because I this is what I think is the is the most dramatic aspect of this is that you get you get these folks who come into office the, that are essentially outsiders and especially business people, and they say. I can fix this budget. I've, that's what I do for a living. I fix budget. This is nothing. Are you kidding? A crummy little you know five billion thing. Well, it looks like when they sat down and looked at the at the places where they could cut, they discovered there weren't really very many places they could cut. Right. And I mean, that seems to be the lesson to me out of this is that is that the only way that Rauner could come up with a budget that was even pretending to be balanced was by making a bunch of I would call them more political attacks on unions and everything else. All his agenda, if his agenda passes, then this happens. But the real issue is that we are pretty much, uh, and I think Bruce Rauner has proven it to us, we're pretty much at the bottom of where we can cut programs and programming in the state of Illinois at this point. So maybe we, maybe the other people who've been saying, no, what we have here is a revenue problem, maybe they're right. Which then, of course, gets us to the question of, if we're, are we going to do revenue? And if so, what, how, when? That's a great question. I think, <laughs> yeah, we don't know. Rauner kind of refuses, not kind of, he, he refuses <laughs> to talk about taxes publicly or what part of that he's mm -hmm. talking about, whether it's taxing retirement income or, or services or, or whatever the case is. There does seem to be kind of bipartisan agreement about um, taxing services. Mm -hmm. uh, what those are, though, which services, I think that's what they're negotiating. Um, as far as his... The, the cuts to the budget, I mean, we're seeing, regardless of, of what he proposed in February, he's put out a new list of cuts now if there's no budget agreement, um, which it looks like there's not, and that's where you're starting. I think this one can be taken uh, or, or seen as, as a little bit more real mm -hmm. than, okay. than what it was in February. So, mm -hmm. But he's doing it in a way that's it's a little bit of everyone's going to be unhappy about this, whether you're, you're talking about social services, heat for people who can't afford to keep their heat on in the winter, or increasing co-pays for people who need to put their kids in daycare, mm -hmm. um, or tax credits for businesses, which has been a, a long kind of a, for several years now, there's been a big debate over yeah. how much tax credits the state gives out and how companies right. just kind of play games with this, saying, uh, I don't know, D.C.'s calling 
they, they kind of want us to relocate to, to D.C. What are you going right, to do for right, us? Right. And Rauner's been saying this has been a long-standing practice that he wants to do. And it's so interesting it's a that the, the, the business guy might be the one who might be able to crack that nut in the end, who might, who might be able to say, you know what, this is phony. We don't really need this anymore. But, but the other aspect to it, of course, is that um, he, he has, Mike Flannery was on the show here a couple of weeks ago and he pointed out something that I hadn't thought of before, which is that, you know, there's this whole infrastructure of services on LaSalle Street and Bruce Rauner knows that infrastructure better than anybody alive. And he could be the guy who could say, you know what, all you public relations firms and client services firms and all the people who, you know, make your money off of the people who buy and sell stocks, you guys need to start paying sales taxes. He could be the guy who did that, and that could raise a lot of money. But he's not willing now, I, I guess, right? He could you, theoretically be that guy. He could theoretically <laughs> yeah. be that guy, but he's not, he's not about to do it if... Um, That's also been an idea floated by the Chicago yeah. Teachers Union who, um, yeah. and, and yeah. some of the unions, I think, that, that Rauner's going to up yeah. against. Well, we, we, we've had some interesting conversation about that because, um, uh, you know, we've had the Center for Tax Accountability and all, and mm -hmm. all them, uh, Ralph, and... Um, what they're saying is that Karen Lewis's tax will never fly the the couple of pennies on the transaction right, yeah. because it, we would it would make Illinois the first state in the union to create such a tax and Illinois ain't going to be that state so that's never going to happen but taxing the services of the people who provide those services could be because it's just an expansion of our sales tax mm -hmm. so you know, who knows? Maybe Bruce Rauner is, is looking. We just don't know. We don't know anything yet. It's too early, I guess. Right? I, I think, yeah, yeah, I don't know, how, and I don't know how serious he is about, about talking about those taxes yet until right. until these other things that he's talking about get done. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, as we wrap up our last minute, uh, you guys are news reporters. We're all, we're all in the news, and the big news that happened this week is Denny Hastert. And I have to say that I don't find it to be a particularly, I wonder, what, what should I say, it's not a newsworthy incident because it's not a government or a politics thing. But how, what was your reaction when you saw Denny Hastert rolling into court? Uh, I mean, the, the, the scene looked um, crazy mm -hmm. <laughs> from just the number of reporters, the national reporters who've come in from D.C. to cover this. Um, and, you know, I was out in Yorkville after, after he was indicted and almost everyone I talked to kind of rolled their eyes like another reporter's talking to me. Right, here. And right. I got a lot of that saying, if you want to talk about how this has impacted, this indictment's impacted our town, look around because it's the number of reporters here asking yeah, around yeah. If, if we know of anything or if ever heard anything. Yeah. Um, so I think that that's sort of, I guess, the, the, this, this is going to be the next year or so, if, if he keeps fighting these charges, um, mm -hmm. you know, I expect just kind of more of the same as this plays out yeah, in downtown yeah. Chicago. All right. Well, it, it is a very interesting topic, and of course, as uh, has been observed, uh, he's not he's not being dragged in front of that judge for anything he did as Speaker of the House. This is, right. These are things that happened earlier on. That doesn't excuse it, but as a government servant, he appears to have been a, a dedicated and clean public servant. Well, that's it. Thanks, for, uh, thanks so much for helping us figure out what's going on <laughs> outside of Chicago, All down right. there in downstate Illinois. Yeah, right. Kim Geiger from the Tribune. Hope you'll come back again sometime. Definitely. All right. thanks. thanks very much. And Tony Arnold, of course, from WBEZ. Always glad to have you here, Tony. Thanks, thanks so much. And you've been watching Chicago Newsroom. It's a community service of Can TV. As you probably know, you can see us here on cable, but you can also watch us online at this here address any old time you want. You can take us with you in the car. Look at that, huh? iTunes. We'll see you next week with another show, and uh, hopefully it'll be an interesting one, too, right here on Can TV. I'm Ken Davis. Thanks for watching. See you next week. Bye-bye.